Welcome to another episode of Sensina Champions. T- today we're here with Inner Mountain Health, where we're going to hear about um, their journey with third-party risk and enterprise risk management. And I am Ed Gaudet. I'm the host of the program, and I'm the CEO and founder of Sensinet. And with us today, I am pleased to be joined um, by Matt Christensen. He's the Senior Director of Governance, Risk, and Compliance for Inner Mountain Health. Hey, Matt. Welcome. Hey, Ed. Thanks. Good to have you. Yeah, good Good to see you. Um, so we've got a lot to cover. Um, we're, now, where are you calling in from these days? Are you in, you're in Utah? Yeah, so I'm in Utah. Yep, we're in a little rural town, just um, about an hour from Salt Lake. All right, awesome. All right, here we go. So we've got a, a pretty packed agenda. Uh, we're going to talk, obviously, about what was happening um, in your program early days uh, and give our listeners some insight into that. Um, and then as you start off your journey and you begin to look at solutions and uh, obviously resources and processes, we want to explore all the different learnings that you uh, were, were had uh, and uh, tips and techniques that you discovered along the way. Um, right. I know listeners love to love to, to, to dig into those uh, those, especially those tips and techniques. So um, let's start off with managing your third-party risk program um, early days, and uh, what was it? What was it like? <laughs> well, when I think of early days, I think of you know just like weeds blowing and and just this wild, wild west scene of like <laughs> how does everyone else do it? And maybe Tum- that's the tumbleweeds. The tumbleweeds. Yeah, the, huh? yeah, the tumbleweeds oh, exactly. Oh. <laughs> um, and and it, to be honest, I th- I don't know any organization that really has done this very well for a long period of time i think that maturity that entrance to maturity i think has happened more recently like in the last five years but i think prior to that most organizations were just doing the best they could with the resources they had in a lot of cases it was like post-it notes and excel spreadsheets and um what feels risky to one and then completely subjective to the other you know, you, you just have this inconsistency. So I, I would describe it as uh, recognized, acknowledged, and managed chaos is probably the best way to describe it. I love that. <laughs> Pro- process and technology light, if you will. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. Now, um, when you think about, um, you know, the, the steps for assessing vendors uh, and products through spreadsheets, you know, what, what worked and what didn't work? You know, in some ways, spreadsheets weren't all that bad because it did force you to, to do something in an organized fashion. Mm -hmm. Um, But again, it, it didn't build process. It didn't favor improvement or maturity. You know, you have rows and columns and then maybe you got really fancy with a heat map that was again, completely subjective. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, I think the easiest way is almost everything was inefficient about it, which is why you don't see people, you know, ditching third party risk management programs and going back to spreadsheets because we've, we've now crossed that, you know, that line of maturity. Um, I think it was, it was frustrating from a frontline perspective where they're doing the best they can with the resources they have, which it, you know, and, and again, speaking more broadly, industry in many cases was office suite, you know, whatever you can come up with in a fancy Excel or in a PowerPoint or a Word doc, that, that's what you would leverage. And so it's been nice to be able to see that engagement be regained from those that are on the front line doing the work. You're enabling, you know, the army with the right utility, I think is how I would describe it. Yeah. And I think in, on one hand, um, you know, spreadsheets, everyone understands what a spreadsheet is, how to use a spreadsheet. Uh, it's lightweight, um, which means it can be shared easily. Um, but there's really no leverage. Um, you can't really leverage the data. Um, it's really hard to uh, drive analysis across the data um, as, you know, individual non, non-structured, non if you will, data yep. that is just uh, sprawling out there across the Netherlands. <laughs> <laughs> an organization. Yeah, and, and then you've got data integrity issues and rights mm-hmm. issues and auditability issues. Um, 
what happens, heaven forbid, if it gets lost and no one has the backup and you're just going back off of, you know, tribal knowledge to try and rebuild it. Um, spreadsheets don't build in process. They don't allow that ability to go end to end in that entire risk life cycle. They don't enable you to, to automate your processes so you can, you know, automatically kick off campaigns or, you know, assessments or set thresholds and criteria. There's just, anyway, I think we can all agree that there's definitely limitations mm -hmm. and we're all glad that we're not there. Yeah. And, and, and not to mention the curation effort that goes right. into building questionnaires and keeping them current and uh, relevant. Yeah. It, it is a gift that we do still continue to receive. I'm glad to not like give the gift of, you know, a vendor, an Excel spreadsheet and say, fill out this. Yeah. Uh, so in some ways we, you know, we get kudos for that. Mm -hmm. um, but in healthcare, there's still a large percentage that are, I would even call them mature organizations that are still operating off of Excel spreadsheets. And Blows so we get, yeah. we get the, those spreadsheets and they're all different, different formats. Some of them have locked fields. And so mm -hmm. there's just this, I don't know, there's just this audible sigh that comes in. Gnashing of <laughs> teeth might be more, <laughs> more accurate. <laughs> I like the audible sigh. All right. Yeah. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's move past that. So, yeah. Um, obviously you were fed up with, with that approach, um, and, uh, you began to look for solutions. So, um, tell us about some of the, the, you know, the early solutions that you looked at. Yeah, I think, you know, without, without naming names, I think the, the easiest way to describe it was there was this once, once it's known in the market space that you're looking for a management solution, everyone has the solution that solves everything for you. Mm -hmm. and and we really didn't see we didn't see that there was a need that was desperately apparent in healthcare yet the broader vendors that serve cross sector and, and all industries i don't know if they didn't grasp or didn't recognize or whatnot but it was really hard to say that assessment works well in healthcare mm -hmm. And then there was ones that were, you know, agnostic to industry, but so complicated and convoluted that you try and, you know, even with the training and with education and just here's how you use the tool, um, it just became complex. And third-party risk management is already complex enough. Your solution, your platform that your frontline's using to ultimately signal to management, here's risk you should be aware of, or here's risk that's tolerable. Um, it, it shouldn't be difficult to be able to do that. And so we were seeing either just, it was too broad, you know, it'd go an inch deep and a mile wide in capability, or it was so technical that it was almost unusable because there were so many fields to put data into, um, fields that were not relevant to us in healthcare or specifically at Intermountain. Yeah, it's that balance between purpose built, you know, getting something that out of the box right. can take you some of the way, um, if not most of the way. And and then there's purpose available flexibility, if you if you will. So the flexibility you need, but not at the expense of being too complicated or complex or or taking nine months to get it to a state where you can actually implement it. And then you have an army. You didn't find out you implemented it wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Then you have an army <laughs> of folks behind it. Right. And it's, it's a very, it's a very complex process and, and, and um, consideration when you think about transforming, because that's effectively what you're doing here. You're, you're transforming your process. You're coming in with a thesis that says these current approaches don't work. The spreadsheets of the world, the, you know, the manual processes don't work. We're going to try to apply technology to it. And then you realize, wow, we can do pretty much anything with this thing. And that's part of the problem. We can do pretty much anything with this thing. <laughs> um, yeah. It was a telling story when we said, let's go back to spreadsheets. And I say that, uh, I say that <laughs> not just tongue in cheek, but yeah. When it's so complex that you're like you revert to what we've always done, right. then you know that you know we haven't hit the mark yet. Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. And the other limitation is because you're you're doing it in the context of your world. Yeah, it may let's let's assume you get it right, right? 
then it's good for your world, but it's there's no lever there's no leverage again outside of your world. There's no way to to really get the community helping you and adding to the process and adding to the success overall of yeah. the program. Yeah, that's which right. Is a, which is a real issue. Yeah. No, that that, that that's great insight. I I didn't realize you guys went back to, to spreadsheets too. Um the um you know you, you you talked about the notion of a vendor or a solution that comes out of a horizontal industry approach, you know, generalizable across the industry. Mm -hmm. Um why does that not work in healthcare? I'm always amazed at people that try to come into healthcare with that approach, mm -hmm. thinking that, oh, it's going to be finance. It'll be just like finance. It's just maybe there's some things we need yeah. to know that are a little different, but. Yeah, I I have the belief. I don't know if it's true or or somehow can be scientifically proven, but I have the belief that, that healthcare is the most complex industry. Mm. And, you know, you have you have this complexity of where your service that you provide can be life or death. Um, it can be, it's much more material <laughs> than, a, than say a product industry or service industry. And so um, I think just the complexity of healthcare alone, which is why you see tech companies quick to enter to solve a healthcare problem. And then just, they kind of fizzle away and and they don't tend to continue to reinvest at least that's that's my perspective again i could be completely off on that but there's just these nuances that um are all built in and inherent with healthcare operations that you can't just take you know one one tool and apply it across um all healthcare if it wasn't built specifically for healthcare yeah no i think that, that that's a great point and I, you know, the the biggest aha moment for me was when I realized that there's a language that's very different outside of healthcare. This notion of even things like saving clicks was so right. foreign, right, um, to me outside of healthcare. And and when I when I when I when I first joined, um, you know, an organization that was beginning to focus in in on healthcare, this the power of that that simple notion, um you know, is so different than what you'd find in other, in no, no other industry talks about saving clicks. I mean, you have yeah. EHRs, Epic of the world that, that they have click counters, right? They literally. <laughs> <laughs> 10 <laughs> clicks to do something you should be able to That's do. Right. One. They sweat yeah. the clicks. So, um, but, and obviously there's a number of other differences once you get in that, uh, that, that, that get revealed to you. Um, so let's, uh, let's move on to, um, you know, eventually you ended up um, choosing Sensinet as a platform. And again, you know, there's things we do well, and there's things that obviously we don't do well. And I think it's good um, for you to, to cover both, quite frankly, um, because, um, you know, we also learn through that partnership with customers. And obviously we're going to talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, but I'd love to get your, your thoughts on, uh, you know, what, what, it, what, it, you know, when you went down the, the road of the evaluation, but also what benefits you've seen since you've been working with us? I think maybe to get to, to brass tacks on that question is uh, Sensinet has proven to be uh, a real partner. Not, we'll make you feel warm and fuzzy till you sign the contract, then we'll leave you out to hang and dry. Uh, but the amount of time and resources that you invest you know, not just with Intermountain, but with, with your broader customer base. I, I've never seen, um, you know, and I'm close to 20 years in IT and specifically in cyber. And I have never seen a, a vendor that that is responsive, that is invested in that time with their customers consistently. If, if so, it's always at the, you know, contract spin up or at the renewal. Mm -hmm. And it's magic how you get all the attention and then in between you're, you're kind of left, but to be able to have, you know, regular contacts that we can just dial up, which we've done many times, uh, to have standing recurring, I would call them progressive meetings where we're not just trying to fix something that may be broken or needs to be tweaked, but how are we planning, you know, three years out? 
um, having that, the technical leaders and, and capability, the, the people, the technical resources on the same calls um, in addition to account manager. So it's not just being passed on by account manager to, you know, a TAM, but someone that's actually invested in that call as well. Um, and I would say quick to respond as far as when we do have enhancement requests, when we do have something transformative, uh, since has, has been an amazing partner to, to not just listen, but to act. Um, and that's not to say that, you know, every idea that Intermountain has is like the best idea that all of healthcare should implement. Um, I think often we find ourselves in that trap, but to recognize that we have a voice at the table, that we've been able to be influential with the product. Um, I don't know how many pilots we've done, Ed, with Sentinet, many, and <laughs> yeah, many have, have stuck and mm -hmm. they're now part of the core product mm -hmm. and others, you know, we just decided let's, let's phase it out. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not critical to the, to the overall strategy. So of, of the many reasons I would say um, that having that partnership was the most compelling. Yeah. And you, you worked with us on a lot of different, um, you know, features and aspects of the product. Um, you know, I love the IRB. I, we, I think we've got it down here, the IRB yeah. uh, work that we did early on with, with your, with your team. Um, you, can you talk a little bit about that, what that looks like? Because I, I often find that um, customers, um, when they hear about it, they get excited. Certainly if they have a research, you know, yeah. uh, in an IRB program, they get excited about it. But, but oftentimes it's one of those things that, uh, you know, we miss, we miss communicating it. Um, it gets buried in the product. Um, but you, you, you're, you're, you know, you, your team uses it quite a bit. So it'd be good to, to Extensively, share. Yeah. yeah. In fact, I think about 50, 50 or 55% of all of our assessments we do fall under that, that IRB category. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're heavy into research. Um, what we found was similar to what we found with, with spreadsheets. And it was, if we make it too complicated for our researchers to follow the process, they're researchers. They will research other ways to go around the process and they will be <laughs> successful right. at it. Right. So rather than fight, fight it, you know, like let's work with the machine. And um, so, yeah, it wasn't just something that even cyber came up with. How could we simplify, mm. you know, an IRB assessment to just the, what are the, what's the MVP? What's the, like the absolute minimum number of questions that we need to ask that ultimately gives us that, that reward of risk classification. And we partnered with some amazing researchers. And I mean, at the highest levels to just say, <clears throat> are these the right questions we should be asking? And can we skinny down, you know, mm. from 250 questions to something like, 20 or 30 mm. um can we get the time to complete down can we agree that there's certain questions we don't even have to ask but they can just acknowledge so that we have you know we everyone in grc has to have that feel good someone has to click a button sign their <clears throat> excuse me sign their name to it mm -hmm. type of feeling but you know through the platform we've been able to really simplify irbs which we're they were expensive. Like I said, over over half of our assessments every year that we do mm. fell fall into that category. And so if if I'm spending all of our time or 50% of our time doing work that ultimately, whether it's 300 questions or 20, are going to give us that end result, um, you know, that was just a decision that, that we had to make to mm. be able to keep up with demand, um, which has been a benefit not only to cyber, but also you know, to the mm. business themselves. Yeah, it, it took us, I mean, you mentioned the partnership. I, I know it took us a couple of times to get it right For uh, sure. as well. Um, you, you had, uh, uh, you know, built a custom solution. Um, so we we're able to consolidate and actually remove some of the costs um, out of your system as well. Um, so it was a really, it was a great partnership um, that uh, added capabilities to the overall platform, which adds capabilities to the community, which again, um, I talk about that leverage. It's so critical that we're able to share that across the community. Yeah. yeah, we have a we have a program at Intermountain called Kudos, and I think most organizations have some kind of employee recognition program. But it's it's rare that we go a significant amount of time without getting a kudos specifically on IRB assessments. 
Awesome. And, <laughs> you know, just thanking us, like how easy it was to go through. And, and we get benefit in that too, because we're documenting the risk, we're acknowledging mm-hmm. it, we're understanding where the gaps are, which we can mitigate through a risk management plan. Um, but then we're allowing the business to actually go do what they need to do with that research, which in our world is improving lives. Right. Like how much more rewarding could that be? Excellent. Um, that's Excellent. my soapbox. That's why I stay. I love it. Here. <laughs> I love it. How about the leverage you get from the one clicks um, and uh, from the digital catalog? How's that been working out for you? You know, I, I'd say it's an area where we, we're seeing success. I think it's an area of growth as well. So um, that's just that's just one that I feel like we we have seen. Like I said, seen, I don't want to be repetitive, but we've seen success with it, um, and it works. I don't know. If it's a one size fits all solves everything. Hmm. Um, in an area I actually feel like we, we will continue to partner with and, yeah. you know, mature as we always do. Mm-hmm. Um, but the idea of it being cyclical is certainly helping to be able to say, yep, nothing's changed. Acknowledge you're good to go. Um, it, that has been a huge satisfier. Right. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Let's, let's move on into the, the impact slide. Um, so can you talk about some of the benefits um, that you're getting at a macro level um, yeah. from, from working with Sensenet in the, in the overall platform? Yeah, I think everyone wants to know, like, how long does it take to complete an assessment? And, <laughs> and then dig into the details of, yeah. well, was it with your team for two weeks or was it with the mm-hmm. vendor? And so it's been, it's been really good, like you said, at that macro level to just say, total, what's the life cycle? <laughs> Everything comprehensive, people with time off or trying to right. investigate. Um, you know, we started out, it was north of 60 days on average to complete an assessment. <clears throat> and that's average, um, the median, in fact. And we've got it down to 21. Um, some would argue that's still too long. Um, we have we have benchmarks that are helping us track to get that, you know, to 15, to 10, to 5. Um, but I think what we're seeing, and it, it's a consistent story that we can tell, is through process improvement and then obviously leveraging improvements within the platform itself. I think those two combined have really been what's driving down that number. Um, I'd love to say it's everything all about the platform that mm-hmm. caused those numbers to completely drop. But in all honesty, there was a lot of process that we had to agree on or change internally to also help drive those yeah. numbers down, which yeah, means the, lo- yeah. the less it takes, the more we can complete, or even more so, less focused on total quantity. But yeah. of those that are of most importance, that's where we can now spend our time. Yeah. And again, not just documenting, but actually managing that risk. Right, right. And in, in, in of that time, I think your completion times were down significantly to I, I saw some numbers five days in the area of five days so so most yeah of that, for for yeah. irbs it's days it mm. does not go past weeks for sure mm-hmm. um i think for our our third parties the majority of the time we're still trying to figure this out is you know how do we get vendors to respond more right yeah quickly to respond and from the vendors. be more responsive yeah yeah, yeah. Yep. good that's great um what um you know, when you think about the data that you're collecting and your ability to to report on that, what what are some you know what, what are the things that you're bringing back to the business in terms of you know reports from a risk perspective, and how is that impacting your relationship um, with the different um, business owners, if you will? Yeah, and I think defining audiences uh, is an important delineator in that question. Um, I mean, the, the tool itself needs to be able to, to tell our assessors where they should be spending their time. Mm-hmm. Um, so what action plans are past due? When, when are reassessments up, you know, and, and then being able to automate a lot of the reminding, I think, is key. Um, for our executives, being able to, I mean, the benchmarking, I don't think that's one of our talking points on here, but being able to pull up benchmarking right within the platform has been extremely valuable uh, because we're able to just say, here's, here's how we compare, compare to industry. Um, and then of course the, 
the assessments that are already baked in with NIST, with uh, Hiccup 405D. <clears throat> I think CPGs are going to be added soon as well. They're, um, they're, in. they're was, already in. <laughs> already in. Great. Wonderful. <laughs> so, yeah, having yeah. having those available, I think are I think that's where at the executive level they're most concerned about is, mm -hmm. you know, benchmarking and maturity level, less about number of assessments, time to complete. Right. Certainly there's a time to complete when when there's a, a business critical assessment, we're holding the business up because we haven't completed. Certainly there is that. But I think, you know, more broadly speaking, the, those benchmarking metrics um, and now that they're real time, I think even it's that much more added value. Yeah, that's great. Um, you know, how, how is some of the data affecting your contracting process? Are you, has that made, you know, has it helped you make any additional changes to that process to streamline <clears> it or? Indeed. And, and I don't know if Intermountain's unique. Uh, I had Intermountain's the only healthcare organization I worked for. So, uh, but I have I've spoken with many others where supply chain and contracting <clears throat> are completely separate. You know, it's, it's just completely bifurcated that it's not an embedded process to have. So certainly partnering with, with our supply chain, understanding as vendors are being onboarded, um, we're now creating, you know, it's another pilot that we're doing, but we're, we're trying to simplify even that onboarding piece with, with supply chain so that we can get them through the system faster. Once it's a selected vendor asking a, you know, a set of condensed questions that again, ultimately get us to that average risk that we're going to get out of a much more in-depth discussion. Right. That's been a huge value add because now we can signal there's huge red flags. Don't use the vendor, go find another one without going through the full contracting process, going through the full assessment process, then raising the flag and saying, push pause. <laughs> like we do not want to go down this route. So in that regard, it's, it's significantly helped and continues to mature. Yeah. It's great. Great points. Uh, any other last comments before we move on uh, around impact? Um, you know, uh, are you able to, um, you know, hire um, folks maybe with, with less experience and does the platform help you onboard folks um, maybe faster into the, the cyber organization or have you seen any of those benefits? I think, I think there are a lot of material benefits um, taking subjectivity out and adding more science to it. So that there's, so it's, we feel like the, the, the data we get back always has to be under scrutiny because you're not sure who filled it out on the other right. end. Right. So when we can remove that subjectivity and, and make it more yes, no, like very, very binary, you know, in, in many ways, then that, that has added benefit. The, the most material benefit, that I think the most impactful is that we can spend less time documenting risk and more time managing it. Mm -hmm. That to me is is where the in, the investment, both in tool and in process, makes all the difference. Because I could have a team three times the size that we do and just document risk all day long. Right. That doesn't help us serve our patients and members better. That doesn't help us improve that business operation or whatever value they're trying to get out of that product. Um, and certainly doesn't bring fulfillment to the assessor that spends, you know, a good amount of time on something. They want to see that risk was identified and it was being managed appropriately into a, until it's acceptable. Yeah. And if you can free your time, you know, your time up, you can focus on other higher value areas of the business. Like you said, that provide a much more direct connection with That's patient right. care and patient outcomes. Yep. Yeah. All right. Um, you you hinted on this uh, this capability already, but let let's go into it a little more detail. Um, so there there is a an area of the product where you can actually assess your own internal operations. Um, so talk us uh, talk to us about that and and how that's helped you and helped your team in Intermountain. Um, we do work that matters, and the work that that we do needs to matter, and so I think the it needs to reflect that 
through the measurement. And that's why I go back to benchmarking. Um, benchmarking has allowed us to not just prove value, um, but it's really to reduce scrutiny in, in some regards of are we underinvested? Are we overinvested? Um, how are we doing on, you know, controls more broadly? Are we at, you know, peer? Are we above? Are there specific areas that we're significantly below? Mm -hmm. And to be able to, to not have to take a metric and then make it easy to consume for a board member, you know, that that's gold there. We can literally copy and paste and put it in the board deck. Um, which has been a, a tremendous value. And, I, and again, I think that, you know, you talked about what other opportunities we have to improve and partner with. That's one that we're, we're doing, you know, is how do we, how do we get more, more metrics that are specific to certain audiences? So more mm -hmm. board level metrics and then more metrics specific to the frontline teams. They're actually doing the work. Um, so we, again, we love that partnership that we have uh, with you as we think about, introducing more broad level risk than just cyber, but, you know, hu human capital risk or financial risk or um, s vendor risk themselves with the actual vendor. <clears throat> so not even cyber. When you look at that entire ecosystem to be able to start pulling in data that can tell a much more broader story at the enterprise level, hence ERM, um, that's a, that's a compelling capability that I think we, we definitely want to double down on and say, how, how is it that we can leverage data that we already have in the platform to make us more informed decisions at, at the enterprise level? Yeah, good, good, good points. Um, you know, as always, appreciate your time. Um, I wanted to make sure we, we give you the opportunity to cover everything. I know, and, and you, you, you exercise the platform extensively. Um, so there's a couple of things we didn't address. Um, so we didn't talk about risk register. We didn't talk about the open API and integration you're doing with your data lakes. And is there, is there anything else you'd like to add um, uh, in terms of your overall usage of the, of the product and platform from a, from a program perspective? Because for many folks that are listening, they may be at various maturity levels and right. uh, you, you, you're, you're pretty advanced, I would say, um, from a TPRM perspective. So I think any insight would be valuable to customers. I mean, I think if we just take a step back from the solution and focus on how is healthcare getting beat, they're, they're getting beat three ways, social engineering, insecure infrastructure outside of your, your firewall, your DMZ, and third party. And anything that we can do to not just paint these big, dark, <laughs> gray clouds of, we can't ever use any vendor because we're going to have a breach or, right. <laughs> um, you know, or we have no idea what the risk is, go use it if they want. I mean, I, I think if we just take that step back and recognize that third, third parties is one of the three main ways that you end up having significant data breaches or, or ransomware events. And so to, to find ways to simplify, whether that's in process or whether that's in a, in a tool itself, um, it's not only incumbent, but, but it's you're negligent otherwise. And so it's like, how, where does that, where does that, drive programs and how does that drive maturity? Um, so I, yeah, I don't know if I answered your question directly, but, but specifically the platform itself has made it easier to know where our risks are at, where, where we're at with our action of those, you know, management plans, corrective actions, um, and then just being able to scale up and just say at, at the executive level, how do we compare and, where are the areas that we should be focused on? I think it certainly has meet it has met that need. Excellent. All right. Any last comments? I think All we right, got Matt, it. Appreciate your time as always. Um, really, uh, you know, it's really great to hear about your journey um, directly with uh, your transformation efforts there, uh, the application of of the technology and uh, and tool, but also um, you know just how you've been. Uh, rethinking your 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 resources, the application of those resources, the people, um, you know, where where do you think where do you think third party risk ends up in five years? How do you 
you know, if you, you could sort of, uh, uh, to, to, to find the future of yeah. TPR, TPRM. What, what I hope like? it's not five. I hope it's more like two or three, but if I were to <laughs> summarize it, not at Intermountain, but industry, yeah. Yeah. I think we spend 80% of our time identifying risk, 20% actually managing that risk. And my hope mm -hmm. is that Flips. in two to three short order, I love that. you know, we're, we're the complete opposite, you know, yeah. like we're now spending the bulk of our time managing that risk. Um, and heaven forbid accepting certain levels of risk because it seems like in cyber, you know, it's like this, it's like the naughty word no one will ever say or admit to that you have to accept certain levels of risk. And yeah. anyway, so yeah, that, that would be my prediction is that we're, we're going to be having more AI define areas that humans then need to go and look at and dig deeper. Okay, Matt, we got some time for a couple of questions. Sure. Let's do uh, it. All right, cool. So we got a question here. Um, tell us about your team and how it's organized. Yeah, so uh, GRC, Governance Risk Compliance, as, as you would imagine, um, risk team specifically, we've got that broken up. So aside from policy and, and uh, aside from, you know, the other components of GRC, but the risk team itself, we've got de dedicated personnel that will cater to just the IRB assessments alone. I mean, like I said before, over 50% of our assessment. We do several hundred of those every year. We've got a, a team dedicated to that. In fact, we've actually got it simplified where it's one primary resource. Oh, wow, okay. Not wow. like five, five. people all yeah. doing IRBs. Yeah. You've got one primary and one backup. That, so that's mm -hmm. been e extremely useful. We have a team that's dedicated on med devices. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it's single threaded with the backup, um, which has been phenomenal. Um, then we have our organization's broken out into demographic regions. And so uh, our manager, Mike Dorgan, was able to define risk assessments by region and then assign them out, which has been super beneficial because they don't have to email some team email distribution and get some yeah. generic response back. Or They're working directly with the assessors themselves and they know mm -hmm. who they are, um, which works great when you have repeat customers, right, that are going yeah. through the the process over and over. Um, and then of course, a, a reassessment team is baked into that. Uh, and then internal assessment. So if we develop our own app, we eat our own dog food, we go through the exact same process, we assess those, um, pre present the risk and action plans. And then of course, on the management side, we've got a team that's broken up into now just managing all that identified risk. Oh, wow, that's great. That's That's really clean. Um, no, another question. Um, uh, let me do this question instead. So, <laughs> you, uh, you, you, you mentioned um, IRB. Are there other assessment types that you do? Um, do you do any uh, internal development and integration? I guess was the question. Yeah, you bet. So we do a variety of assessments. Uh, we try not to overassess because that we're, we're already a complex industry. We don't need to add complexity. Mm -hmm. um, but we do internal assessments. So if there's a, an application that's being built, homegrown, not not a COTS app, um, it will go through that assessment. We do an assessment if someone wants to set up a B2B account in, mm -hmm. in Microsoft or if they want to set up an SFTP. Uh, all of that goes through its, you know, a level of assessment. Certainly, we don't send the same questionnaire like we would for med device or through a, a third party vended solution. Uh, we've got cloud assessments, on-prem assessments, hybrid assessments, assessments about assessments. <laughs> we, we pretty well cover it all. <laughs> all right, good. Um, question about uh, oftentimes organizations have an architectural group. Do you have that, and how do they operate in your process? We do, and and you know, I would say if if you don't have that built as as a core component of of your program. You certainly need someone to fill that that role, um, because the truth of the matter is the assessors will have their own limitations and and may not even know all the right questions to ask. So, it's certainly baked in where we have triggers within the assessment themselves that when we know we're going beyond the capability of the assessor, or when we know it's it's hit a, a point of complexity, that we bring in the architecture component and 
and add them you know to it and a lot of times we'll actually start an assessment with the architect right there involved in the mm. process so that it can be done you know in parallel but uh, yeah more so with more the the technical the cloud-based assessments um, where you've got you know really complex architectures or business requirements that's where we'll typically bring in our architecture team got it um how long do you give sorry you, you mentioned um that the long pole was vendor response how long do you give them before you'll um, disengage? That's like the golden question. I wish we, I wish we had a, every vendor, we nag them every minute of every day until they respond when they hit five days or longer. Uh, oh, the truth okay. is we don't have it. And, and it's baked in to be fluid because we'll have our set of assessments and then the next morning we'll get a priority assessment. And so we, we, we allow for that flexibility where, where we don't just have a set, no matter what, at three days, they get that. Um, what we're trying right now is, you know, there's this principle of going to Cambodia. I think you and I have talked about this on a prior podcast, but actually putting ourselves in the shoes of the people receiving the assessment that don't mm -hmm. work for us. They, have, they just want to provide a service to Intermountain. And we're not trying to make it complicated. Um, we're, we're piloting a program now to say, is the best way to use a dedicated account person to reach them? Do we mm -hmm. leverage someone in the contracting? Do they have more sway? Do we force legal to say, you agreed to be responsive and timely? Um, do we send it through Sensinet? Do we send it offline? So there's, I think that's an area that we we're looking for insights to figure out the, the best way. I just don't know that there's, we haven't found anything that works perfect every time. We have found that by adding expectations and then reminding them of those expectations, um, specifically on the ones that are just business critical, that's the ones where we'll tend to remind and harangue as my mom, we, she would use that term. <laughs> we, we have some customers that actually are, it's, it's binary, either participate or we don't work with you by policy. Yeah. Do you think yeah. you'll, ever, you'll, you'll ever get to that point or? You know, I, I I would love for us to get to that point, but I'm also not the the business person that gets to make that call. Yeah. Uh, we've had some that refused until they understood if they just did it once through us, then they get that benefit of all Cincinnati customers. Yeah. So they're you know, us having patience with the vendor, vendor having patience with us, we've we've found that mutual benefit. So I don't know that we'll ever get to the point of uh, you know, do it or die. Because there are certain vendors, and you know this, said there are certain vendors, they're Goliath. And so are you going to get them to fill it out every time? Absolutely yeah. not. Yeah. Um, but that is one assessment type that we didn't talk about, and that is a proxy assessment. So that's our ability to document the known risk from an internal perspective. So we at least have something. And that those proxy assessments allow us to keep the business moving forward. Um, we actually rely on those heavily. Yep. Great. Um, last question here. Um, you didn't mention reassessments. Do you do those and how do they work? We do. Yeah. So we've got tiering that governs the reassessment cadence. So the higher the tier, the more frequent and more, uh, in, I don't know if intense is the right word, but certainly the more in depth mm -hmm. assessment we'll do and lower risk, you know, we're not going to bother them as much as we would a, a higher risk service. Okay, great. Excellent. So help us get there, Ed. <laughs> yeah, we will. Thank you very much, Matt, for your time. I uh, appreciate you as always, and uh, I look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks, Ed. All right. Appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks.